Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our first uh, class here. Um, Lord willing, maybe we'll have some more if you guys think it valuable. Uh, but our goal uh, today is to encourage parents who are uh, uh, navigating this uncharted uh, territory of homeschooling right now. And so our hope and our goal is to encourage you and also give you hopefully some helpful information and resources to assist you. And so um, that's our goal. And again, we're, we're grateful that you are uh, joining us today. And so um, um, you can go to our website at www.senate.ca.gov forward slash morell. M O R R E L L, and we have some great resources we've put there for you um, available. Now, I, I certainly don't have all the answers to, to the questions, or, or am not a scholar on history, but um, I have gained uh, much by uh, some of the resources we put on my website. Um, love some of the series, and what we've done is we've structured it in hopes that. Um, um, you know, you have some variety, like Hillsdale College has a Constitutional 101. I think it's approximately, it's an introduction of the Constitution, an hour and 20 minutes. And then there's the Kirby Center for Statesmanship out of Washington, D.C. You can look up their website. And they've also got an assorted amount of videos and education materials to help you. And then there's a, a podcast, which I like, uh, and that's called the Hillsdale Dialogues. And here's why I like it. It's sort of a drive-through history from beginning and politics and what's happening today. For an example, um, Homer was one of the first to write a book, books um, in history in approximately 800 B.C., and one of his works was the Iliad, which was 24 volumes. Okay, and That's a lot of reading, right? Or you can get three 32-minute segments on the Hillsdale podcast, and then if you decide um, that perks your interest, then perhaps you can go buy those 24 volumes. But I love the fact that they do the same thing, again, starting history with going back to the Greeks, Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Virgil, all the way up. They go through uh, uh, Aquinas, uh, uh, Lincoln, and the Lincoln-Douglas debates uh, previous uh, to the Civil War, which is one of my favorites. Um, and then, of course, all through history to Churchill, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, this is what's happening in the Soviet Union all the way to today. And so that's a that's a handy little way to get 32 minutes worth of increments and, and then you decide uh, which, which topic you want to delve into a little bit more. And so what we've done is we want to give you a background on, on our country. We love our country. You know, today we're sort of in a, a discussion uh, nationally on if we go towards socialism or if we remain a free government where governments, uh, their powers are limited. And it's, and it's back to a nation of, of, by, and for the people. So I want to give you some background on that. But also the events we're going to talk about leading up to the uh, July 4th, 1776. The reason this is so important is what I've learned uh, being in the state California State Senate, uh, a lot of people... Uh, uh, seem to have a perception that this document will sign one day and then the next day we have a country. And so really, there's people that have written books, and, and some of them are, are, the title is The Founding Era from 1730 to 1805, uh, uh, which is 75 years. And that's what they feel it took. And then others said, well, no, it actually took longer. And so um, what I've done today is I'm going to give a brief history leading up to the founding on July 4th and the Declaration. But you have to go back about 150, 160 years to do that just to sort of get um, you know, a feeling what's happening. And so I'm, I am going to go through that and just give you sort of a light dusting on that. Then I'm going to slow it up and uh, talk a little bit more in depth about uh, the Declaration of Independence and why its meaning is still applicable to today. And so then in the meantime... Uh, I wanted to find somebody who could help me on the United Constitution because uh, after the 4th um, of July 
you had uh, the war came, the Revolutionary War, which was seven years, and then we sort of came back trying to get our country started and took another six years to write the Constitution. Then after that, another, you know, uh, we elected a president, and then in 1805, the Great Northwest Ordinance. So right there, you know, you've got a lot of years spanning 25 over almost 30 years to actually, would, would you would say, would sort of solidify that we had the United States of America. So I needed someone on our Constitution. And so I found a person, and I've known her since she <laughs> was very young. I think I met her on the day she was born. And if you look on the flyer, um, her name, she's a professor at um, uh, uh, Arizona Christian University, and she's been teaching these classes since 2013. The college loves her. They would love her to even teach uh, uh, more classes, but um, she has four children, Cora, Molly, Micah, and Tess, and uh, she's been married to Jeff for 12 years. And anyway, to make a long story short, she's homeschooling right now, as many of you are, and she plans to do that again next year because she is really like that. So the, even though Arizona Christian would like her to teach more classes on this, she's decided, she's. Uh, can you believe that, this younger generation, she wants to uh, make her kids a priority. But anyway, on the flyer, the reason I know her is we put her middle name, which was her her maiden name, and it's it's Morrell. So Kristen, I introduced to you Professor Kristen Morrell Rudder, who of course is my daughter. So Kristen, welcome. Hi, hi, Dad. How are you? <laughs> good. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Good. Well, thanks for joining us today. And uh, and what we'll do is we'll I'll start off just so you know, and um, I'll slow the pace up a little bit. But anytime uh, you want to be injecting something into uh, you know, what I have to say, please do so. And likewise, um, you know, it, that conversation go both ways. So, again, to our parents in the audience, thank you for being here. Uh, we hope we hope this is an encouragement and helpful to you. And, again, Kristen, thank you for, um, for helping your dad out today. Thank you very much. No problem. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, I'd like to set the stage for the conversation on why it's important to look at our national heritage and the influences on our uh, county's, uh, country's county. Uh, uh, each of us have a responsibility to be civically active, paying attention to what our government is doing and consider the decisions that have been made uh, through the lens grounded in our nation's first principles because we have gotten so far away from that. I think it, it is a disruption to our security, both local, state, as well as national level. And so we have a duty. That's what the founders wanted it to be, a, again, a government of by and for the people. So we have to exercise our civic responsibility very vigorously and know what's going on so that together we can determine the direction and uh, fate of our country, always of those words and ideas that bind us together. So as a state center, I do spend much of my time explaining how to be involved in the legislative process. And I'm going to say my website again and my email, so if you want to uh, get online and look at some of those documents we're going to review today, well, please feel free and do that. And if you want to email us any questions, we'll try to get back to you. We won't be able to do that today. This is our first time we've had a call like this, and so we will try to answer those questions. But first, if you have a pen, the uh, website is www.senate. S E N A T E dot C A dot gov slash morale and morale is with a capital M and then low uh, lowercase O R R E L L again M O R R E L L and then my email is Senator capital S and then lowercase E N A T O R dot morale capital M O R R E L L at Senate dot C A dot gov and I'll give those uh, one more time so. Um, with that, um, aside from the mechanics of how these things work, we want to share the appropriate role of government as well as the safeguards put in place to protect us as citizens so the government stops overreaching into our private, personal lives as well as our business as much as possible. But before I actually get started, I want to read some. I came across, uh, there, there was a book that I have that it, it's the founding era from 1730 to 1805. A lot of political speeches were written, and I, I'm only going to read about two paragraphs of this, but um, um, it's a 26-page speech, but I, I love these two paragraphs I'm going to read because it's a testament to the importance of education 
and parental involvement. So again, uh, parents, thanks for being here. And I hope you appreciate this uh, as much as I did. Again, it was written by a gentleman named Phobes, F-O-B-E-S, in 17, the year 1795. And he says this, By a law of nature, we all begin to exist in a state of helpless infancy under the control, entire control and direction of parents. This means children early on have become members of a family, which is in itself an empire in miniature. Having formed in the molding of age, of life, proper ideas and habits of government and life. While this benevolent law of nature speaks louder than the tongues of men or of angels, the necessity of early education. Therefore, in the tenderness period of life, do this by giving birth and energy to every possible institution through the education of our young. It teaches parents also the ministers of religion and others that while employed in the humble office of instructing our youth, their services may be as patriotic and perhaps more useful to your country than the wisdom of their councils in the Senate or the valor of their arms in the field. And as a state senator, I can verify that your services um, and wisdom is more important than all the wisdom in the councils of the Senate. And so we need uh, uh, parents uh, and good citizens to be involved in, in uh, taking back and electing good people and stuff. So, again, parents, uh, thanks a lot for taking this, this uh, um, rising up to this task. So with this, I'm going to begin. Um, and, Kristen, if you want to chime in at any time, please do so. But mm -hmm. I'm just okay. going to start. We started to settle. The, the, the settlements started around 1620. Uh, with the pilgrims who came uh, to the Mayflower to Plymouth, Massachusetts. And rem one, uh, I'd like to just put a note here, too, that uh, we're not here today to promote religion, but it did play a prominent role in America's founding, and therefore it cannot be ignored. So the things that I say today are not words from Mike Morrell, but they're from the early founders, and I put some of those quotes um, on you know, the things that, that led them to founding this country in the documents. And so the first question is, why did these people come, and, and why uh, did they sacrifice? Remember, they left um, to come to a foreign nation with nothing, right? Uh, uh, they left their homes, their communities, their loved ones, their relatives. They left their jobs, their farming community. And remember, uh, this often took three months to sail over here through treacherous seas, and uh, they believed that they would probably never see their families again. So, so it was like, wow, why, why would they do that? And, and on the Mayflower, there was 102 people that came over on that voyage, mothers and fathers and children, and many of them, in fact, almost half, 45 of them perished. They died. And so what would possess a father and a mother to, to, to sacrifice like this and to even lose uh, their children? And so I think the answer is found in, in, in the first uh, couple of paragraphs of the Mayflower Compact. And I'm just going to read a few of the lines in there. But really, they came for freedom. They came for rights. They were tired of living under a dictatorship uh, called a king. Um, and so they say this, and, and I'll read this, and it's on the, our website. In the name of God, amen, we, whose names are written, written the loyal subjects of our king, uh, James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, Ireland, we having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Now, here's the part that, that I really, really enjoy. Uh, uh, and in the presence of God and one another, ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation. And then I skip down the line. And they, what they want to do is frame just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, and constitutions and offices because they were tired of being steamrolled by their government and their king. So they came here, again, uh, number one for faith, but also to frame a new type of political body um, where the laws would be just and equal within their constitution, laws, and offices. And so what a tremendous act of... Uh, self-sacrifice they did just for, again, liberty. 
And then approximately 10 years later, you had people like the Puritans coming over on the Arabella. Um, you had their leader, who was a gentleman by the name of John Winthrop, and he made a quote in sort of relationship to why they came, is that they would rather die free than they have to live under uh, tyranny. Um, yeah, and that John go ahead, Winthrop, Chris. Uh, yeah, no, he, uh, yeah, he, you mentioned he comes across on this ship on the Arbella, and he writes this speech that really encapsulizes some of the, the drive behind what they're doing. And he writes this speech called City Upon a Hill. And he says, he says, we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. So so what's going on with Winthrop? What, what, are, what are in their minds as they are coming to this new land? What they saw, what Winthrop saw is they saw America um, as having a great mission that they could be an example of virtue in the political context. And so with this, this speech, City Upon a Hill, Winthrop is actually quoting from scripture, which was later echoed um, by other presidents like uh, John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan. But again, he says, we shall be uh, as a city upon a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us. So they thought that there was a weight to what they were doing, that there was a special purpose with America. Mm. Yeah, and you know, it's it's interesting. I read one time where they call America the great experiment, right, in self-government. Right. And that yeah. was, and many uh, from Europe said that, but it was actually a, a, a knock, a slight, like really um, self-government, ordinary people could really self-govern. Um, even our, our anti-federalists believed only the wealthy or the prominent or people with some kind of pedigree should only be the people to be elected to office. So this was a great experiment in self-government, and uh, the world did not think that that would ever take place. So um, thank you for that. And um, I love Ronald Reagan's quote when he quoted that, because that's what his goal was to try to restore that luster back back to America. So good thought. Thank yeah. you, Kristen. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. so then the colonies came, and a lot of them, of course, were religious sects like the Quakers and the Lutherans, uh, but they didn't want to necessarily settle in together because they had um, different views on their religions, like the Baptists and the Anglicans settled in Virginia, the Quakers and the Lutherans spread out in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and uh, they kind of wanted to do their own thing and and, and, and be uh, separate from other religions because, again, that was the first time uh, before in history if you did have religious uh, the ability to worship, you usually adopted the faith of the king. So, you know, if you were in England, you had to be either the Church of England or an Anglican. So these guys were ready to uh, get loose of the shackles of big government and do their own thing. But they began to fall, uh, form these colonies and even colleges like 1636 Harvard was uh, founded by the Puritans. Then a few years later in 1693, the College of William and Mary uh, that was by the Congregationalists, and, and you can see just the history starting to develop. But the colonies uh, were not without challenges because they came here with nothing, and there was nothing here. They they took nothing and made something out of it. There was no agriculture. Uh, there were no running water. Uh, there was not even a uh, Home Depot any place by where they could get things. So uh, remember, you had also some real big, big challenges. You had... Um, 13 colonies and 11 currencies. So think about that. How do you how do you do commerce and sell your goods and services? Um, it was convoluted and very difficult uh, uh, thing to to do. Um, and so yeah, and so, go ahead, sorry. Um, oh. Yeah, and those thir- 13 colonies that you mentioned, I think we tend to think of them as that they were this one cohesive unit that goes up against England. But before they went to war. Um, they were very separate, separated from one another, and they even, when they would deal with England, they would deal with the crown separately as separate colonies, and so they were very much disjointed. Yeah, yeah, a good, I like that, because they did take, um, I mean, this is great, because they're, this whole time they're trying to figure out what does a country of freedom look like, and so you've got a thousand different opinions, and so that's why, you know, I, I moved that down and, and wanted to just bring a little bit of a, 
um, step-by-step thing how we eventually got uh, to uh, 1776. Um, but also we had no standing army. So how were we going to fight the British, uh, you know, 100 years later when Washington, if he'd go to a, a colony that did did not have the British there, they wouldn't give him any, any money to hire soldiers. And so, um, you know, it was it was amazing that we even won that war. Um, but, yeah, no standing armies. And then there was a high mortality rate because, you know, we didn't have the medicine we needed, and it was a tough, uh, uh, rugged frontier back then. But that just demonstrates when people live under tyranny and despotism for, uh, you know, a thousand years, the power of freedom. And, and again, that they, they went through these things just, again, for, for liberty and for freedom. Um, but a couple yeah. of things started happening. Uh, these concepts began to develop, and one of them in the early 1700s was the concept of natural rights. In other words, today, sadly, everybody thinks they have a right to this and a right to that, but natural rights are only few. Like In other words, we should have the r- ability uh, to life, um, to property, and what property meant back then wasn't just a house, but anything you or I work for and we sweat, we get a paycheck, and then if we buy that thing, whether it's a hat or a coat or a land or a watch, that's my stuff that, because I earned it. Now, our, our charitable hearts may say, I'm going to give my watch away or my coat, but government and nobody has a right to take those things. And so that's part of natural rights, that and the ability to, to worship um, according to the dictates of our own conscience. We're tired of this. And so before there was a, I get them confused, the book Lex Rex or Rex Lex, and what um, uh, what that means is first you worship the king first and then God second. Well, this began to turn around that, no, God gives rights. King, a mere man, does not give rights. But And that had been sort of uh, being thought of even as far back as the Greeks, but it hadn't taken hold. Uh, even during Augustine's time, and then it got into the political philosophy community of, of Rutherford and then John Locke, and then it began to make it into the American mind that perhaps we can be self-governed rather than be ruled by kings. And so in the meantime, America begins to prosper in agriculture. You've got these hard-working people coming over here. And so the king takes notice, right? Uh, the new king, of course. This is years later, 100 years later. So he begins to be what a kings do. They're, they be, they're tyrants, right? And so he notices that these, uh, this American uh, experiment has started to take hold. People are starting to make money. So they, he starts imposing tax after tax after tax, starting in 1733 with the Molasses, Molasses Act, and then he taxed paper, and then he taxed glass, and then in 1765 the Stamp Act, and then the, the Boston Tea Party was a tax on tea. Then you had the Intolerable and Tolerable Acts. And then Jonathan Mayhew, who was a leader of a religious sect of people, believed that, that anybody who would do that without... Uh, you know, representation is an oppressor, and they're no better than a common pirate as they, when they infringe upon the rights of a people. So, so now, as you can see, this country's beginning to form even more, and these colonies, these 13 colonies, begin to write charters. And so I picked up one, and um, I, I have Section 15 and 16 of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, um, because this is this is what most of the col- colonies believed that they needed to promote good government. They wanted government to serve the people and not the other way around. They wanted the government to be public servants and not masters. And so, how do you do that? How do you have an honest society? And so they wrote that they believed that morality and religion were indispensable supports for good government as well as uh, for prosperity and peace and safety. So in section 15 and 16, and I'm only going to read a portion of it, and it's on, again, our, our website from the Vir- Virginia Declaration of Rights is their form in this country. They say no free government, again, no free government, or the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people, but with a firm adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, and virtue. So they're going through the virtues. Uh, by saying this is what's going to promote good government. And they, if you skip down to Section 16, uh, they say that, um, therefore, all men, um, and of course we know, and women, um, are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dicta- dictates of their conscience. And, and here is that it is a mutual duty of all the practice, and I love this, forbearance, love, and charity towards each other. Those were the, the foundations 
of what they would believe, that they believe would promote good government. And so, um, so that was again written in many of the first, almost every single uh, charter um, expressed that yeah. sentiment. And so now, when we go on, um, yeah, we'll and, and well, yeah, and, and your the example of the Virginia Declaration of Rights is, is excellent. Uh, and one of the things too, on just the practical side of this, is this idea that they were they were practicing charter writing gave many of these colonists practice in self-governing, right? And so this is going to prove, as we lead up to the Constitution, it's going to prove to be an advantage because they're going to be already in the business of, of writing these sorts of laws and charters in order to produce a constitution. Um, and in doing so, they have already been exercising self-restraint. They've already been self-governing um, in, in the Americas. They, um, they're very much a contrast then to the French Revolution. And we see that just shortly after the American Revolution. The French Revolution um, has this different result because when the people of France did gain freedom, they had a much harder time self-governing. They hadn't had the practice that we see that the Americans had for many, many years leading up to 1776. So, yeah, that's a, that's a perfect example for um, what was going on with, with the charter writing. Um, yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, I, I love this kind of stuff hearing about this because, again, what a wonderful country we have, and people, I, we've lost our ability, history. History, um, I think Churchill said, the more we understand the mistakes of the past, the better we can understand the future and where it's going. But he also said the thing that we can learn from history is most people don't learn from history. And it just, uh, again, the more you understand the past, the past, the better we can understand what's going to happen in the future. And I am concerned about our country. America has been the most prosperous, powerful nation on earth. And again, we're we're at a um, a, a crisis. Uh, Dr. Arn from Hillsdale College believes we're in the third great American crisis. And whether we're going to remain a free government or go into a despotism, government ruled by a tyranny, perhaps that could happen. But in the meantime, we will work hard to restore those political principles which limit government's power. So I'm just going to take, um, and again, for those of you who join on late. The, for the conversation, welcome. And uh, my website reminder, uh, which some of these materials are on there, is www.senate.ca.gov uh, slash forward, uh, forward slash morale, capital M-O-R-R-E-L-L. -L. And an email, email reminder is senator.morell, M-O-R-R-E-L-L, -L, at senate.ca.gov. Okay, so we've moved through over a hundred years of history in just a few minutes. So I'm going to start to slow it down a little bit. And now we're at 1774, which was the first Continental Congress. And here's what is interesting. Uh, they just didn't write one Declaration of Independence. There was six drafts and one original draft. And uh, that's interesting to me because it took two years of these, uh, these delegates going to uh, Philadelphia arguing these things out. Can you imagine that? You have uh, 56 of them representing. Remember, even though you have 56 people who signed that declaration, they were representing other politicians back in their colonies. So they had to do what, you know, so I mean really the, the real figures like, you know, there's probably 400 to 500 people that had their hand in this pie because if I was a delegate from Virginia, I had, you know, 50, 30 politicians back there who, you know, I had to get their agreement. So anyway, I'm going to work the Declaration of Independence back a little bit because what America is doing is they realize they're going to have to cut ties with Great Britain. And, um, in fact, they, they say that in the very beginning um, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another. So that's the very first sentence. But then what... I'm going to do a skip back a little bit because there's probably 30, 35 things here where they accuse the king of England of all the abuses. It's a, it's a list of abuses, and I'm only going to read maybe five or six quick ones. But he does he's dissolved the representation, uh, the representative house repeatedly. He, in other words, he will not let us. 
have a government, meaning the colonies. He keeps invading that with us. Another thing, he has made judges, not us, but his judges are dependent upon his will alone. So that's a very dangerous thing, as I think we all know. Um, and also, to follow that up, he, detri- he deprived us uh, of the benefits of a trial by jury. Instead of being trial by, you know, um, a trial by uh, 12 of your peers, uh, his judges decide. So what a dangerous uh, president that was uh, set. Um, he also kept standing armies during peacetime um, without our consent, um, with large bodies of uh, uh, troops. He had mock trials that would harm us. But here was another thing. We were beginning to be prosperous with our trade, and he cut off our trade uh, with all parts of the world. That was another abuse that he did. Um, and the reason why is because we were prospering, so they took our ships and uh, cut off our trade. And then also, as I stated earlier, he uh, began to impose taxes and tariffs without our consent. And then he plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, and literally burnt our town and destroyed the lives of our people. So that was called, that. they're making their case. Here's all the abuses. And, of course, you can read, and we've got this on our website, the Declaration of Independence, and you can go through there and see the many other abuses for the reason why, and, of course, human uh, events. They're finally saying, we're done. And, and, by the way, they even state here that repeatedly they had petitions, meaning the 13 colonies, which they're pleading with the king, we want to work things out with you. But it was only answered with more injuries, which the king uh, placed upon the people. So at that time, they finally get ready and sign off the Declaration of Independence, uh, about the second to the last paragraph, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. They are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. So now you have to understand now what's, what's about to happen. Once you sign that, according to Benjamin Rush, you're creating treason against the king, which was, by the way, punishable by uh, typically hanging, okay? And um, I'm going to skip, I'm going to come back to the declaration, but just so you know, some of those signers, uh, what they did is the last paragraph of the declaration, I'll read it, they sign off, and, and it's beautiful. It's the way every patriotic American should really live and believe today. And it said, so, and so, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance, reliance on the protection of divine providence, which I understand means under the benevolent protection of God, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And sacred honor meant you give to your country and your fellow country, men and women, and your children and your families, the deepest part of your soul, as well as your money and, of course, your fortunes and your um, sacred honor. And so that they, they did, and their life. And, and so by signing this out of the 56, a number of them did lose their lives. Nine, I believe, was punishable by death. Five were captured and brutally tortured. Twelve did lose their, their property. And the list goes on. One gentleman by the name of John Hunt signed that declaration, and when he finally returned to his farm, his farm was uh, torched and gone. His wife had been in prison, and then he was able to get her out of prison, and she died from her injuries, but his 13 kids were were, um, dispersed. And so he never, his wife died on him, he lost his property, he lost his wealth, and then he never saw his 13 children again. And um, he died penniless, and he died lonely, by the way. And so that was truly one amongst many who who did pledge their lives and their fortune, their sacred honor, so that we can enjoy what we have today, these rights. And so so let me uh, start off by uh, one uh, phrase in the Declaration that I want to hit. It's it's my favorite phrase. Uh, They say we uh, today that the Constitution is a living document. Well, Lincoln said that uh, it's not, and I'll explain in a minute why, but he looked at the, he would explain that, that here, here's how the two documents go together, that the Declaration of Independence is like a solid, precious gold apple. But to protect that solid gold apple needs to be a solid gold frame. So the solid gold frame is, to be, is the Constitution, which protects the solid gold apple, which is the um, Declaration of Independence. And, of course, so what it says, it says um, this. It says, to assume, in the first paragraph, the powers 
of the Earth, the separate and equal station to which, and here's the phrase I'm coming up to, the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, meaning do we have rights and where do they come from? Well, according to the concept of natural law, which again in the Declaration says the laws of nature, which means we can determine what's right and wrong, okay? And we can determine self-evident truth. We can determine that we do not live according to moral relativism, which is the, the thing that I think we live today. They teach it in schools. Um, you have 7 billion people in the world, and if we did live according to moral relativism, then everybody has 7 billion different opinions. So is there a way of getting to the truth? Well, the laws of nature essentially meant we can study nature, meaning you know, not just the birds, but human nature is what they meant. And we can study history. History gives us, uh, um, again, a key to what's happening what's going to happen in the future. And and so that's called the laws of nature, but they were put there by the God of nature. And so if if you could discover true, truth two ways, through human nature or through divine revelation, and, and that would be what we mean by God in the scriptures. And so here's that, that was the basis, by the way, for law in America. Every law school used to teach about the natural law because because we had to get to the truth. And again, it's not a living document because of the laws of nature. Nature's God means it's self-evident truth. And if you go down to the second paragraph, it states that, it, which rests on top of the laws of nature. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And so there is self-evident truth. And let me just share a story. It's, it's kind of funny. At the same time, it's kind of sad about uh, Clar Justice Clarence Thomas, the Supreme Court Justice. When he was being confirmed to the Supreme Court approximately 25 years ago, um, he was asked by then Senator Joseph Biden, um, what is your framework? What, how will you make decisions? In other words, from what foundation will you springboard from to make your decisions according to you know, the law? And uh, um, uh, Clarence Thomas said, well, according to the natural law. And um, uh, um, Biden said, well, I'm not sure what you mean by that. And so Clarence Thomas proceeded to um, uh, quote the Declaration of Independence, according to the laws of nature and nature's God. And Biden said, where did you get that from? And so we can laugh at that. And I, yes, I am a Republican, and Biden's a Democrat. But sadly, up on that dais, there was both the leading-ranking Republican senators and Democratic senators did not know where this came from, which was the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. So you can see we've strayed from these self-evident truths, and I think that's why there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, pain in our country and in the world today um, is because we, we've kind of gotten away from the things that made us um, a secure nation. Um, comments, Kristen? I need to take a breath. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, regarding the laws of nature, natural law that you're referring to, you know, it's sort of a, a sort of more simplistic, like a simplistic way that we can also think about it, especially if we have some students listening in. You can think that there are, just like there are laws that govern our physical universe, right? We can think of the laws of gravity or all sorts of laws of motion and such, that when you push against them, there's, there's some sort of response. So we have physical laws that govern the universe. But more than that, there are also moral laws that govern the universe. And so there's a cause and effect to the things we do. And these moral laws found in the natural law, these are timeless. They are universal. In other words, these laws transcend time and space, that they are applicable and true for all people at all times. And, and as you mentioned, we can know these, we can discover these through reason um, as well. And so just sort of coupling on that notion of natural law there. And it really leads into then, as you mentioned, self-evident truths, and you're sort of working your way up to this idea of these rights that I think you're, you're heading towards in this declaration. Well, um I think I'll jump on that point. I want to apologize. I just got a text from my office from Christopher saying that um, I need to turn the volume up on my phone. So I did that, so hopefully you can hear me better now. I did not know it was low. So I apologize, but hopefully you heard what I said. At least I uh, hope you got the good stuff. Um, so anyway, 
So let me read this, and then I'm going to turn it over to Professor Rutter here in, in about two or three minutes um, um, on a couple other things I'd like to point out on the Declaration. It says, um, so we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, one creator, so they were monotheistic, with certain unalienable rights among these, which are life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. Um, and then to secure these rights, governments are instituted amongst men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Uh, I want to get that second half, the consent of the governed. That's the first time this was ever written into a political document, meaning government no longer is going to rule us. No longer are we going to obey kings, but we're going to be governed by consent. And so the, the, the good thing about that is that was in the hands of the citizens. Like, in other words, we get to elect our own leaders. You know, some people say to me today, hey, we need term limits, but the founders built in term limits, right? We can reelect congressmen every two years, we can reelect governors every four years, and U.S. senators every six years, and presidents every four years. But the thing is, is we keep sending back the same type of people a lot of times. We have to get better at upgrading those people who we send to represent us because um, it's more up to us since we're governed by consent, again, the first time in history. So it's really up to us that we understand these political principles and that we're real careful who we send to represent us. There's only 40 state senators in the state of California that makes laws regarding education, regarding how much money you can keep uh, out of your paycheck, regarding state taxes, uh, city taxes, property taxes, um, high-speed rail, uh, climate, whatever you want, only 40 that, that, that affects the lives, our votes, on over 40 million people in California. And so um, it's interesting because when I ran for this office, time and time again for state senate, people would ask me, who, who am I replacing? What state senator? Uh, few people knew who their state senator was. And so um, that's not good if we're going to be free because, again, I love the fact that this is the first time written in a document that we're going to be governed. It's our consent. So if we like the people in politics, it's because the people are paying attention and we've elected good people. If the people aren't good, well, then we've got to get better at our politicking. So that's a great phrase, and it's probably one of my favorites. But the phrase right before that is we're endowed by our creator with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And happiness, by the way, didn't mean the materialistic. It, it comes from the Beatitudes about being blessed when those when you show mercy or um, you want righteousness and that type of thing and it, it says the pursuit of and it means it's really hard to be happy we have to work at it but it comes from being virtuous and again getting back to those first um, uh, um, drafts on the um, statements from the charters and so um, that's what the founders meant now there is a, a challenge too one thing I want to say is, was this meant to be? Remember, our country had slaves, and so was was did the founders mean for the slaves to be to have life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? And what's interesting, I just want to remind you that in history, um, you know, Jefferson didn't bring slaves here. For an example, he was born into it. Um, the King of England had brought slaves here over a hundred years earlier, and then he put laws in America that you couldn't release the slaves and. and Unless you had all these conditions, so it was a, a really challenging time. But Kristen, you've got some insight on that. Oh well, yeah. Regarding, um, and we'll we'll talk a little bit um, about the the issue of the slaves as well. Um, I just want to touch briefly on this term, unalienable rights, too, from the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's an important point when we think of rights. The founders believed that every man and woman possessed unalienable rights. And what that means that's unalienable is that they were wrapped up in our personhood, that to know what a human being was is to know that it's a, it's a, it's a being that has rights. And it's an important distinction to make because as we're studying after that, this is indeed going to be this free government, a, a constitutional republic, it's important that the citizens, that you and I and anyone here living understands that our rights do not come from government. Government does not say you have the right for life, you have the life, right for liberty, pursuit of happiness, and so on. No, these rights came from our creator. They are part of our personhood. And you cannot extract the rights 
from the person. However, what we think, well, wait a second. I mean, even even the situation of the slave, they weren't enjoying their life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. They were still beings with unalienable rights, but those rights were being violated. So the point is that government, government can either protect those rights or they can violate them. And so the, the goal of good law is that those rights are going to be protected. Ah, good, good. Um, very good. And, you know, as that, in the beginning of my conversation, remember I mentioned there was one, we're up draft and six others, so we're the seven draft. I happen to see uh, that first rough draft, um, um, they write, the founders, um, and it's on my website, by the way, regarding the issue that they wanted at that time. Uh, well, let me just read a, a portion of it, and you'll see um, they're trying to end this because they know it's wrong. Um, and he said that he has waged, meaning the king, a cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, meaning they brought them to America, or to incur miserable death in their transportation, meaning bringing them across uh, uh, the sea. He said, this is warfare. It's the warfare, and it's prostituted itself. And the king's determined to keep an open market where men should be bought and sold. He has prostituted the, him for suppressing every legislative attempt, meaning there was attempts in the legislature to try to end this um, prior to the founding of the country. But he um, suppressed every legislative attempt to prohibit or to restrain this commerce. Anyway, um, the purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them and murdering the people upon whom he also, um, anyway, I'm going to skip down here and says, with these crimes he urges them to commit against the lives of another. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for a red dress in the most human terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered by repeated injuries. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a people who mean to be free. And so what happened is, in my understanding, is you had a couple of colonies, I think it was South Carolina and Georgia, would not sign on because they had slavery. And so at that time, uh, by signing this document, England was coming, and so they redrafted then the final version of the Declaration of Independence, uh, leaving out that section because they needed help from those colonies that had slaves because they needed their any kind of war material that they had to be able to fight Britain. So anyway, they, they signed that uh, declaration, and then the war was seven years, and then after that you had six years of signing, and then um, the founding period sort of ended in 1805, and then finally Abraham Lincoln steps up in 1860, and eventually um, drafts the 13th and the 14th Amendment, which ended that. But let me even uh, just share two more things, and then I'm going to turn over to Kristen. Uh, Martin Luther King, in one of his famous speeches from 1963, he does say this in uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s words, when the architects of our Republican wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So our country has suffered much by not following the laws of nature and nature of God, which God had intended to be all men to be free. And so, um, so that has been one of the challenges in our nation. And again, if we would have stuck to those self-evident truths, everyone knows, you know, not just by law, but they know in their hearts that slavery was wrong. Let me just close out one, one last thing that I wanted to uh, um, say here about um, um, our um, Declaration of Independence. That was an immigration statement, too. Remember, uh, French, France was started by French people, Spain by Spaniards, England by English, and we had uh, people coming from different nations here. But what Lincoln believed that to be an American 
what links us together since it isn't a race. This is the first time in history that a country is founded based on a set of political um, documents, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence. So to be an American, you need to first be able to understand these things and then live by those things and promote those things. And, and he, in fact, in um, 1858, Lincoln writes a speech, and I'm going to read the last paragraph and turn it over to Kristen on what he says about this. this he's talking about how we can put, become, even though we're, we're not related to people, how do we become the blood of each other's blood and the flesh of each other's flesh? He says this is, that is um, returning to those people who wrote the Declaration. This is the electric cord in the Declaration that links the hearts of patriotic and living, liberty-loving men together that will link those patriotic hearts as long as the love of freedom exists in the minds of men throughout the world. So, um, so there is a few uh, things. Hopefully that's been helpful. And then we had the war, then the Constitution, and the next step was to form a more perfect union, which means on this side of heaven, it'll never be perfect. But we as citizens have a duty to try to make America better when it's our turn. So I would now like to turn it over to Dr. or um, Professor uh, <laughs> Kristen Rutter, if you will, for uh, the purpose of government and talking, leading us up to the Constitution. All right. Well, thank you. Well, good. Yeah, that the timeline and the lead up is so helpful. And hopefully, as you're listening in, you just sort of you can picture with your mind's eye sort of the plight of what it would take to come to America, to cross the Atlantic, to be here in a new place, um, and trying to build something out of it. Um, and so, we're going to look at some of the aspects of the Constitution briefly. And of course, we think of the Constitution as something that we know that there's scholars that can spend their lifetime sort of uh, dissecting and inspecting every part of the Constitution. But we're going to do something where we can get the real heart of the Constitution, point out a few of the main aspects um, along the way. But I want to back up a second here and just talk about the purpose of government. Because if you're listening in, you think that in some way there is some, some something about the government that we ought to care about. So why do we care about government? Why do we care about America's founding or our Constitution? Well, really the question of government is asking how should we live and how should we order ourselves and our society? The the system of government and then the the kinds of laws passed will uh, directly influence each one of our lives. Every one of you listening will be influenced by the kind of laws that we have in America. Uh, they're going to impact the amount of freedom that each of us will enjoy. They will impact how prosperous uh, we may be able to be in our economic pursuits or affect um, our ability, each of your ability to chart your own course in life. Uh, and again, as that Declaration of Independence says, to pursue happiness. In other words, are you going to be able to seek to pursue to fulfill your life's purposes. Well, since we live under a constitutional republic, it means that uh, you and I, as citizens, that we cast votes for representatives who are going to create law on our behalf. And so it then requires that we citizens keep those representatives accountable to us to act in our best interest. But even at maybe a more deeper consideration, too, as we go into this, what we do today, the sort of work we put in as citizens, we are going to leave something for the next generation. We want to leave a legacy for our children and for their children. And, and what do we want that to look like? Will we work to preserve our great nation for ourselves and for our prosperity, for our posterity, um, will our children enjoy some of the same freedoms that you and I get to enjoy today? Uh, Ronald Reagan said, he said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed it on for them to do the same. 
Um, and so we're, we, we sense that there is something very important about what we're doing in government, you know, and, and what. And so we can even ask this sort of fundamental question, then, what's the purpose of government? So we know that it impacts our lives, right? We know that when things happen, certain laws are passed, we feel the uh, implications of those. So what's the purpose of government? Uh, and in other words, how are we to measure generally the goodness of our nation? Uh, well, Aristotle, Aristotle simply put that something is good if it fulfills its purpose. And so what's the purpose of government? It is to provide us justice and to preserve the rights of citizens. And so the founding fathers who we've, we've been discussing here and some of the things that they went through leading into drafting the Declaration of Independence and splitting with England, um, we, find, we find in their writings that they reflect two main fundamental truths as they begin to form our nation and to write the Constitution. Um, and I'm going to quote Madison from Federalist 51 a couple times, but Madison says sort of famously, he says, what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? So what he's asking is, then we must ask of the founders, what did the founders believe about human nature? Because what they believed that man is, the kind of creature that a human being is, is going to influence the way that they're going to construct the law. And so they have two fundamental truths that they, they look to, that they begin with. And the first thing that, that they start with that we've, we've hit on is that they believe that human beings are created with these unalienable rights by their creator, right? And so it follows that if, if uh, you and I, if we all have unalienable rights, then it means that all men are equal to one another. Now, we can look around ourselves and we can go, well, we're not all the same, right? We're not the same and in, in, in equal in talent or our ambition or the circumstances in which we're born, but in what are the ways that we're equal? We are equal in rights. We are in, we're equal in our inherent dig with dignity, our value, um, our claim to the protection of our rights. And so those are the ways that we're equal, and since we're equal, it is unjust for one man to rule over another without his consent. So, and so we get – oh, go ahead. Yeah. Professor Rutter, so in other words, the, the new thing that I'm concerned about is socialism. Everybody's equal. Um, it, it, and I know what it means, but is that what the founders meant? if you want to just give a little quick clarifying point on this. <laughs> well, so, yeah, you're right. There are different views of what equality means. So in the sense of the founding, the founders believed in equality of dignity, value, and equality before the law, that you all have the same opportunity before the law, that the law treats everyone the same, right? Mm-hmm. And then there's another um, competing view of equality and that, that that isn't enough, that you need to have equality in every aspect. Usually it ends up being, especially in the context of socialism, that everyone needs to be equal in terms of their wealth. No matter the different choices that they made in life, that we would all be the same in our, uh, usually our, our income or our wealth. So you're right. There's, there's a difference in the view of equality. One thing uh, that I heard, I love the illustration that I heard one time, everybody should have the right to be able to line up at the line and run, you know, the 100-yard dash or a marathon, right? But um, yeah. not everybody should finish equal. The one who trained the hardest and worked the hardest should get the prize, right? And so that's the difference, I think, of America. We we want everybody to be able to compete and line up at that line, but but not necessarily – Everybody can't finish equal. It's going to be the ones that work the hardest deserve the prize. And I think that's that's the thing. We we do want people to give them the opportunity, but but sometimes uh, when you don't have that opportunity, and this happened in one of the colonies. Uh, I forget what uh, Roger Williams has said that in one of the colonies he founded that they tried to share everything equally, the food, and they found that the young men were hard working harder than the older men, and at the end of the day. The younger men quit working hard, and so he saw it falling right. apart. 
you know, people uh, lost mm-hmm. their desire to w- want to succeed. And so it just, you know, it didn't work then, and, and it's certainly not working in uh, other countries now. Sorry to interrupt you, but... Uh, no, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, that's a good example. And when we see it, when government attempts to get rid of all inequalities in a society, right? That they that if they if if people believe, well, it's not enough that they're that we're equal in our opportunity and equal before the law and equal with rights. Um, but if we want to go through society and try to remove all inequality and, and sort of have everyone the same, it requires such a large amount of our freedom. You can almost say it's a transactional cost that you have to lay aside so much of your freedom for you to pursue your life the way you want because you have because you have to be the same um, as all the other citizens. And usually it means we're equally worse off, right? It doesn't mean that everyone's sort of being raised to a higher standard. It usually means pulling down. And it, it's sort of also, too, the view of trying to make everyone the same in wealth is just sort of a very shallow view of human be- as, as a human being because it assumes that you can measure someone's success in life by their income when you could look at many, many very successful and talented people who weren't driven ultimately by money, right? Maybe the income was not the driving thing, and they pour themselves into something where maybe they're extremely satisfied with their life's work, but you wouldn't look at the money they made and say, well, they really did well with their money, right? So there's so much more than to measuring the um, the fulfillment of one's life than just money, but that tends to be where we go in with the socialist thinking. It's it, very much stirs up sort of the, the envy in our hearts, right? Looking at what we don't have in terms of usually wealth and wanting what, what our neighbor has. So, no. And in this limited form of government, government in a limited form does not guarantee how you're going to finish the race. And it's not going to control what you chose to do with your freedom, right? You were given an opportunity your rights will be protected, you will be treated equally under the law, and then go and make, you know, make your choices and live your life. Um, and so that, that leads into this, this idea of um, being equal, that it is unjust for one man to rule over another without his consent. And, Dad, you touched on this uh, under the Declaration of Independence. We got this idea of from social, the social compact. But in other words, the government, the United States must have our consent, the people's permission to legitimately rule over us, right? And and again, we know that that hadn't yet been realized for the slaves. Um, And it's important to note regarding slavery. When the Declaration of Independence spoke of unalienable rights, it was speaking of these truths for the first time in any political document up until that point in history with the hope of putting slavery on the road to extinction and that that hopefully at some point in America's future that we could end slavery and allow for every man and woman in our country to enjoy these rights, that these things spoken in the Declaration of Independence would be fully realized by every every one of our citizens. Yeah, you know... um... I love it. Uh, one of my favorite founders, Governor Morris, he was of Pennsylvania. He was not the governor. That was his name, Governor, you know, Morris. But but he, in trying to get the Declaration of Independence, that, that clause in there, he did believe that the curse of heaven will be upon the states where it prevails, meaning if hmm. this continues, that you know, God's curse. And what's interesting, and I did put a, a, a just a little note to our audience. I, I put a, the second draft. Or I'm not the second draft. The second inaugural speech of Abraham Lincoln, and um, um, it's the second shortest inaugural speech. But yet, more books have been written about that inaugural speech than any other one. And he kind of explains uh, who's to blame for slavery. It's kind of interesting. Not the slaveholders, sort of those people who knew better, um, and a lot of people sort of who pray to the same God, read from the same Bible. I think what he was saying is they shouldn't have kept quiet. But but it's a very serious speech on how. He just believed it was a curse of heaven. Um, but then he sums it up trying to bring the nation together. So I put that in there because it is one of my favorite uh, speeches, and I hope you take time to read it because it's not that long. And the beauty of Lincoln's words, I, I wish I could write like that. I, I'm sad those seven years I spent in high school did not. <laughs> but go ahead, Chris. 
Yeah, no, LinkedIn, and LinkedIn's great too because we see LinkedIn is able to really fulfill what the founders began, right? He, he's not correcting what they did, he's fulfilling what they began. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's great. And so that, that is then the first view of, a uh, fundamental view of human nature held by the founders of this, this, uh, unalienable rights and this human being full, full of dignity and, and intrinsic value and equal, and equal. Um, but, but also very important for us to understand, it, um, about what the founders thought about human nature is then sort of on the other side of this with all this, this intrinsic value and equality is that founders thought that human beings are innately flawed, that you look at human beings, you look around, you look at yourself and you, you go, yeah, human natures are flawed, we're greedy, we're envious, we're slothful, we can be prone to violence, right? We can be corruptible. Uh, Lord Acton said that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So think about, we all can sort of conjure up in our minds different examples we've heard on the news of corruption. Was, and, and I want to take it sort of to political corrupt, corruption. Um, so think about when we hear in the news that politicians have been bribed so that they'll vote a certain way or that we find that some of our, the funds from our budget are being mismanaged. Um, so every year, and I'm not sure how long running this has been, but there have been ver- various U.S. senators that compile what they call the government waste book. And uh, it chronicles some of the ways that our top tax dollars have been spent. And I say spent use, uh, loosely, really wasted. So I just wanted to give an example. Um, in the waste book for 2019, we spent $22 million to bring Serbian cheese up to international standards. We spent hard-earned tax dollars from citizens of the United States to the Treasury, and they sent $22 million of it to bring Serbian cheese up to international standards. So, Chris, um, you probably know <laughs> Serbian cheese. But, uh, <laughs> that's not I see California. There's so many things. I could spend, in fact, another... Mm-hmm. Thing here, just going down the budget on the way taxpayers' money is being spent, just in California alone. Sure. But anyway, sorry sure. to interrupt. You. That that. Yeah. Is- no. It's, and you can go back other years. I just pulled a recent one, but it, it's 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 almost laughable if it wasn't sort of sad to know that that's some of the money that has been earned. Those those were earned dollars sent out for various pet projects, and some of them are even more ridiculous. Um, yeah, so so back to this idea of human nature being flawed, right? Human beings, when they get power, often can be corruptible. And so, uh, again, Madison says, and I'm going to refer to this one quote from Federal 51 a few times, but he says, he says, regarding human nature, he says, it may be a reflection on human nature that such devices, in other words, checks and balances, should be necessary to control the abuses of government. So he, it, Madison is saying here that because of what human nature is, that there are, um, it, it is pertinent that we put checks and balances into place to help control the abuses of government. Uh, so what are some of the examples of that? Um, you can think of one of the, the abuses of government Probably a, a very serious one is the many unelected bureaucrats who control federal agencies today. That it's grown in size and scope behind, but beyond what the founders um, would have envisioned or thought good, and, and have really become a threat to our liberty. Um, out of many of these regulatory agencies, they make these burdensome rules and regulations, and these hamper both our freedom and, and even our economy. They can make business even very much more difficult um, to run. So we, in light of what human nature is, then we needed to create a system of government with limited power. So the, the founders are thinking, okay, we have to balance this government to be effective, right? It's got to be effective, and yet we have to limit it. So how do you do that? Uh, Federalist 51, again, I'm going to go to go back to this quote. Madison says, he says, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. So what's Madison saying? Pretty straightforward. He says, 
you know, if we were angels, we wouldn't need government. And in, in the, the other way, if angels were to govern over us, we wouldn't need to limit their power. But neither of these things are true, right? So he continues, he says, in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed. So in other words, government needs to be effective at governing. Uh, then he continues and he says, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. In other words, government cannot become too big or too invasive into our lives. And Madison continues, he says, a dependence on the people, on the people, is no doubt the primary control on the government. So Madison's saying that the people are the ultimate check on government's power, that that you and I, that we have to be actively engaged in what our government is doing. At Thomas Jefferson said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And that's eternal, right, that we are to always be watching what the government is doing. And then to finish off what Madison says, he says, but experience, experience, right, has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precaution. So what's an auxiliary precaution? These are checks to the power uh, of government beyond just the people, right, checking government's power. So what's an example of an auxiliary precaution, a check and balance. So we could think of um, we can think of just simply that the president nominates a Supreme Court justice, but the Senate confirms because power cannot be held in the hands of one body. So we as citizens in this self government need to know at least a something of the Constitution so that we can protect our freedom. Well, uh, I think, so I want to get – oh, go ahead. No, I was just – that whole thing what you're saying, too, being in California, the unelected bureaucrats and the agencies, you know, it, it was just kind of funny. And one of the counties I represent, they came out with, you you know, the masks, which, okay, I, I get this, but you can't go outside the house without a mask. You have to drive in the car without a mask. And then the unelected bureaucrat says, in fact, you are going to be th- uh, fined $1,000 uh, plus possible imprisonment or both, you know. And so he put that out there as an edict, and then the sheriff of that district, uh, that county that was elected, said, uh, that's fine that you did that, but we're not going to enforce it. That's just heavy-handed, violating the Constitution. Let's give people a chance to do it on their own. But not only that, what I've seen like in construction, uh, first-time home buyers, what prohibits first-time home buyers in California is an aggressive, uh, regulatory body, and it hurts our economy and our younger generation. And that's all I'm going to say because I think we've got yeah. about 10 or 15 more minutes left. So sorry to interrupt you, Kristen, but I had to, <laughs> I had to get that. No, out. no, no problem. Double time it then. All right. So we'll just touch on a few more main points here for sake of time. So, we, so this is the lead offense of the, the actual drafting and or the, the writing of the Constitution. And, and when you see that word constitution, what a constitution is, it, you know, you, we, we hear these terms so often that sometimes we don't really understand the weight of different words we use. Uh, but a constitution is a document that limits powers of government. In other words, the, the constitution outlines what government can do, but government must stay within the boundaries defined by that constitution with the goal that it would preserve or help secure peace and safety and the happiness in our society. So as we are, as we are about to talk about the constitution, it needs to be discussed in connection to the Declaration of Independence, which we've, which we've touched, uh, gone through quite a bit that you touched on that. Um, and again, and you hit on this earlier that Abraham Lincoln described the relationship between the two documents, that he likened the Declaration to a golden apple and then the Constitution as a silver frame around it. And he said, to quote him, the picture was made not to conceal or destroy, but to adorn and preserve it. So in other words, the Declaration of Independence is the, the goal and how do we preserve it? So when we look at the Declaration of Independence, it wasn't just this political tool to declare independence from England or and, and create this new nation, but what it does is it clearly outlines the goal and the mission of the United States. You could say the Declaration of Independence is the why of America, or as Lincoln called it, the golden apple, 
right? It's the prize. Um, and so then the Constitution can only really be understood in relation to the Declaration of Independence because that Constitution's purpose is to try to preserve the goals and, and mission of that Declaration of Independence. So what's the goal? Again, it's to promote and protect the Declaration of Independence. It is the silver frame around the golden apple. And so we're going to see the Constitution outlines the powers of America, and, or excuse me, the powers of government, and you could say that it is the how of America. Now, at that time, the, the draft, right before, Prior to the drafting of the Constitution, we had the Declaration of Independence, but we were living under the law called the Articles of Confederation. And so um, the, we had the Articles of Confederation, but we found that there were some, some pretty important problems with it. Um, and so I want to just touch on a few problems with the Articles of Confederation, and I, I cautious, cautiously say this that it was actually, a, it was federal government under the provisions of the Articles of Confederation were too weak. So some of the problems um, under it, that only, uh, each state only had one vote in Congress, regardless of its size. Um, Congress didn't have the power to tax, and so it held the post-war debt, but the states controlled the money. Um, under the Articles, there was no executive branch to enforce acts passed by Congress, there was no national court system, and amendments required a unanimous vote. So these were some of the challenges uh, under the Articles of Confederation. And so uh, most agreed that we needed a new law, right? The Articles were not working. The the war had really exposed some of the major problems. And so there was a, a differing on exactly how a new law should look. And so can you imagine, it, you know, if you're listening, put yourself in, in the minds of these founders and these colonists that have toiled and sweat and they, to produce this new country. They have just fought off England. They fought a war against England because of England was fringing upon American rights. And so they're very leery about creating a new government that would give too much power to a centralized or federal government. Would they possibly end up in the same situation that they had just been under under England. And so once the Constitution had been drafted or written, there's this heated debate over its merits, and the lines of those for and against the draft were, were drawn between those who favored this new Constitution and called themselves the Federalists, and then those who thought that this Constitution gave too much power to the federal government and was dangerous, and they called themselves the anti-federalists. And so you have these two groups. And so we get to a point where the uh, federalists want the Constitution to be ratified, to vote for it, to make it law. This was going to require that of the 13 states, nine would have to vote for the Constitution to make it the law of the land. And so you've probably all heard, if not studied, portions of the Federalist Papers. This is an example of the, the debate that was going on around the Constitution and if it should be voted for. And so the Federalist Papers is this, these 85 anonymous pamphlets that were written um, throughout New York in, in the paper, and it was with the purpose to explain the merits of the Constitution so that the people of New York would vote for it. Now, we know now the authors were James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. And a side note for you, if you're listening, this is... You there? Kristen. Our audience, we lost Kristen. I'm not sure what happened. Anyway... Kristen, did you come back? Hello? I think. We're... Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes. Oh, okay. Where did where did you drop off at? Better list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyhow, so the so the Federalists are going to go back and forth, um, and and I think one of the the takeaways of the the debate between the Federalists and, and anti Federalists is they're just going back about the. Um, the merits of the Constitution, and it's really a, a beautiful process because in it we see that our founding was birthed out of debate and a discourse over ideas, and that good law, like it does today, it requires deliberation um, and discussion. And it's important to note that the Constitution is the only federal law 
passed by the people through delegates, um, and it is the supreme law of the land. Um, so I just want to touch on a couple key aspects of the Constitution. How are we doing on time? We've got about nine minutes. Uh, you, prob- you probably have about four more minutes to go. Four more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So a couple aspects of our Constitution. And can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So our system is a republic. And what does that mean? That means a constitutional republic, right? It means that we as citizens vote for men and women who go on our behalf to create law. And this is a representative form of government. And we talked about the, the pow- that there has to be checks and balances and that we limit government's power. So we created three branches of government, and I'll touch on the first three articles of the Constitution. And we have Article One, which establishes the legislative branch. And this is the first branch mentioned in the Constitution, and it was known as the People's Branch. It has two houses to represent both large and small states as well as both local and national issues. And it was meant to be the most powerful and the branch closest to the people, and the purpose was to create law. And then Article 2 establishes the executive branch headed by a unitary executive or a president, and the purpose is to enforce the law, to execute the law. And we see as each one of these articles is listed, we see each branch is interacting with law. John Adams said we are a government of laws, not of men. And then Article 3 establishes the judicial branch. And, and funny enough, this, this was thought to be the least powerful branch of government. It uh, established a Supreme Court. Judges would serve lifetime appointments, be insulated from politics. Uh, Hamilton in, in Federalist 78 said that this judicial branch would have neither the power of the sword or the purse, uh, and it would have neither force nor will, but merely judgment. So the purpose was to adjudicate or to interpret law. And then, um, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to chime in. Our president now has been trying to, his staff has been trying to nominate originalist judges. And, and what that word originalist judges means, they believe in the Constitution according to the laws of nature. Nature is God, that there is self-evident truth. And um, so it's a return back to the principles of what's contained in the um, Declaration as well as the Constitution. That's what that's meant by originalist judges. thought I'd just point that out. Yeah, 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 that's great. Uh, yeah, excellent. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we have these three branches, these three separate branches, and they have checks and balances on all three. And then, again, this was what Madison called. He said these are the auxiliary precautions. And we have all sorts of checks and balances. Uh, for example, the president can veto a bill passed by Congress, and uh, likewise, treaties made by the president must be voted on by the Senate. So there's these different ba- balances between the branches. Um, and next I want to talk about or just touch on quickly the Bill of Rights. And these are our first ten amendments to the Constitution. Now, in the original Constitution, there was no Bill of Rights. And so this was a point of contention with the Anti-Federalists. They wanted a guarantee of the protection of our civil liberties. So the, the Federalists agreed that they would add a Bill of Rights shortly after the Constitution was ratified, and so these Bill of Rights were ratified in in 1791. Um, We've talked about separating power between branches, but one other, one important way that we separate power is through this idea of federalism. And what federalism basically is, is dispersing power between the federal government, so think Washington, D.C., and our local government. So we know certain powers are best performed and executed by the federal government. Think of our national defense, the military, uh, treaties with other nations, um, our currency, our money. But there are certain powers that are best exercised at a local level where it's vital that the laws reflect the needs of the local citizens. Think about how how diverse our country is from region to region and state to state. We, We differ greatly, whether it's our type of commerce, our industry, our difference in size of population, our weather, topography, and so on. These these differences make it necessary that laws can be tailored to the specific facts of those areas. And additionally, though, too, power at the local level allows us as the citizens to keep a closer eye on what the government is doing. And most government at power 
was exercised at the state and local level up until about the 20th century uh, and around the time of FDR. We have started to release a lot of our local power and give it over to the federal government. So there's been a shift away from federalism as earlier intended. Very good. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the Tenth Amendment, when you read of it, the last of these, um, the Bill of Rights, it exemplifies this idea of federalism. And I just want to read it quickly. It says, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states or reserved to the states, states respectively, or to the people. In other words, the government is not given the right to do something listed in the Constitution. That power is held for the states and the people. And then lastly, I just want to touch on the Electoral College. This is another aspect of the Constitution, and this deals with how we elect our president, and this has become a more controversial portion of the Constitution, I think largely because it's not understood. Um, But basically, each state gets electoral votes, and they have as many votes as they have total representatives in Congress. So each, each state has two votes per state, which reflects the Senate, and then also... Uh, it reflects the interests of smaller states. And then they have the same amount of votes as they have representatives in the House to reflect the interests of larger population states. Um, without getting too technical or into the weeds, the Electoral College then represents both local and national interests, and it forces presidential candidates to campaign not in just highly populated parts of the country, but to try to represent all of our nation. Um, and so we encourage, oh, go ahead. Yeah. We've got a map up on our website about that, too. You can look at the uh, map of the Electoral College. Very Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and I just want to end with just to say that we encourage you as a listener, you don't have to know every detail of a, the Constitution, but you as a free citizen um, should have a basic understanding of what it says and how you can make sure that our elected leaders act in our best interest. And I just want to end with John Adams. He said, you will never know how much it has cost my generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you will make a good use of it. Well, Kristen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. Grateful. Um, Thanks for doing this with your dad today. Um, Appreciate that. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. And, um, um, and by the way, our audience, thank you guys very much. For I, I hope this was useful to you. Again, we left uh, plenty of information on our website, so we're grateful for you being here. We ask you to take care, stay well, and may God bless uh, your health and your family. And this concludes our uh, little discussion. Thank you guys very much, and have a good day. And I'll uh, signing off now. Bye bye.